cuts and privatisation across London. We need to get organised. We need to pull people together. And we need to actually build a, a united movement because the people uh, uh, we're fighting against have a very clear conception and a very determined approach. We need to be equally as determined and equally as committed in what we do if we're going to stand a chance of fighting back. On April the 1st, our NHS is going to be abolished as we know it. The bodies that actually run uh, the commissioning of services locally are going to be scrapped. The primary care trusts, the strategic health authorities, now, nobody's going to die in a ditch over those bodies themselves. A lot of them were pretty un unaccountable and whatever. But they managed to actually to replace them with something worse. They replaced them with something even less accountable, even more remote, even less likely to take any notice uh, of, of your concerns and your issues. Co co clinical commissioning groups, which in theory are going to be run by GPs, in practice are going to be run by management consultancy companies. In practice, they're going to be ordered round by a national commissioning board that is a national body, doesn't meet in public, doesn't publish its papers, and has complete control. And if it doesn't like what the local commissioning group is doing, they can change the leadership, reorganise it, merge it with another one, close it down. They have total control. In addition, the GPs, who might have the illusion of being put in charge, Increasingly now, don't send a letter of referral directly to the hospital after discussing with you where you should be referred to. Instead, it goes to what's called a referral management centre, where a group of bureaucrats, some of them nurses, some of them not nurses, some of them accountants, sit down and say, isn't there a cheaper way of delivering this care? And in an increasing number of cases, send it back to the GP again, saying, no, we don't think this is appropriate, you should go somewhere else making a total nonsense, if there ever was any sense in the notion of patient choice. This is actually coming down the line. This is happening on April the 1st this happens. And it transforms our NHS from a public service publicly provided, the service that was set up in the teeth of austerity, in the depth of financial pressures and so forth in 1948, to provide services free at point of need, collectively funded uh, for, 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 for everyone, free at point of need, funding from taxation, breaks that up from a collective service which can plan where to allocate resources on the basis of health needs into a market in which people will compete for shares of the NHS will exist basically as a fund to buy services from a variety of providers some of which will remain public sector because they're generally providing the services that the private sector doesn't want and some of which will increasingly be for-profit private companies and non-profit so-called social enterprises where the private companies haven't yet worked out how to make any money and the services. This is what's coming down the line. This is what the government's Health and Social Care Act really represents. And when we look at this scenario, what Karen has outlined, I think, really well is that Ma Manchester is a microcosm of these events. Greater Manchester, the, the problems that Karen outlined, these are problems run right across the country. You're not exceptional. Everybody is facing varieties of these same issues. And Karen mentioned the Mid-Staffordshire report. We shouldn't forget this, the Francis report. It's got really important information there. Because it shows, Karen talked about these staffing cuts and that they will necessarily impact on patient care. What the Francis report shows, page after page, is a trust First and foremost, trying to balance the books in order to maintain, achieve and maintain foundation status, and passing through at the board level, nodding off, nodding through, cuts, deep cuts, massive cuts in staffing levels of nurses, frontline staff, doctors, people without whom you can't deliver proper care, and not bothering to make any of the most nice, tenuous risk assessment of what might be the implications of those cuts. And what shocked me reading that report is that Francis was shocked that was going on. Because I tell you, you can read board papers of almost any trust anywhere in Britain now, or certainly in England, almost anywhere in England, you read board papers, they're doing that, thing, that sort of thing every day of the week. That is exactly the way they're approaching it. They do not bother to find out what the impact of their cuts are, because the first and foremost and only consideration they have is how do we actually make these financial savings. So that's one thing that comes out of the Francis report. It gives an example of how it can go horribly wrong. If all of the superhuman efforts, and basically in most cases, the reason it doesn't go wrong on the level of Mid-Staffordshire and get exposed in the way that Mid-Staffordshire was, 
It's because of superhuman efforts of the people left behind. After everybody else loses their jobs, the people left behind do put in that extra effort. They do put in unpaid time. They do actually make it possible for services to maintain a level of decency. But where that collapses, where the management is so bloody awful and, and, and bullying and domineering and indifferent to the conditions of the services they're delivering, then even that morale can collapse. And that's what happened in Mid Staffordshire. People who went in, trained, uh, equipped, and no doubt going into the NHS, wanting to deliver good care, wound up delivering unacceptable care. And who's been hauled up responsible for that? Not a single manager, not one manager anywhere in that trust has been hauled up for any kind of discipline or any kind of uh, censure for what they've done. No names were mentioned. Like, nobody was blamed explicitly in the Francis report. No recommendations for how the manager should be held to account for setting up a system in which it's impossible for professional staff to deliver quality care. Not a single manager, at any level. Including, of course, we now have a big campaign, led curiously by the Daily Mail, but never mind that, but for, for Sir David Nicholson, the Chief Executive of the NHS, who was a regional health boss at the time, and presided over this mess and did nothing, and, uh, of course, the Care Quality Commission bosses and people who also, and their forerunners, who also ignored it and did nothing. The, the campaign is for Sir David Nicholson to resign. Why should Sir David Nicholson be singled out? Well, not only did he do nothing then, but he's done nothing ever since. As soon as this has emerged, did Sir David Nicholson, as Chief Executive of the NHS, start an immediate reappraisal of how management should work? and going back and demanding that managers put systems in place to prevent this happening again? No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Still hasn't. We've had two Francis reports now, all those findings. The Francis report had all those hearings day after day, examples showing exactly why Sir David Nicholson should have got off his fat ass and done something to deserve his £270,000 a year salary by actually setting out to change that system and make that system work for patients. Did he do anything? No, nothing. Nothing whatsoever. That's why it should go, not because we're picking out him as one example out of, out of failures years ago, but because nothing's been done to learn from those failures and translate that learning into a change uh, regime in the NHS. It's exactly as bad now as it was before. We've got managers as cynical now as they were before. And we've got managers doing things with impunity now like they did before. And that's the scandal. And that's why somebody's head should roll at the top and not just pick on people. There's 40 nurses and 40 or so doctors facing various levels of discipline from their professional bodies as individuals for what went on in Mid Staffordshire. Meanwhile, the Director of Nursing has just walked away from the Nursing and Midwifery Council, having decided she had no case to answer and actually facing no further follow-up. Now, how can the person that set the system rolling that forced these people to fail walk away with no discipline and all the individuals carry the can for a system that failed around them? that they had no voice over and where their complaints and problems were ignored. How can that possibly be right? So that's the kind of scenario. And I'll raise you another point, uh, a learning, a point of learning from the Francis Report. Okay? This is the dog that didn't bark. All of us as campaigners, we were braced for the Francis Report to come out. We were convinced that immediately after that, all the right-wing press, including the Daily Mail, would be saying, oh, that shows the NHS can't possibly be put back together, together again. The NHS is completely hopeless. Let's just privatise it. Let's take all these services over to the private sector. And they haven't done it, have they? Why haven't they done it? Because the private sector doesn't do any of the services that are at the middle of the, of the Francis Report. They don't do A&E. They don't do complex cases. They don't look after chronic ill uh, people. Or, or anything remotely risky, or anything that doesn't guarantee a profit. They don't do it. They're not interested. They don't want to do it anywhere in the world where they can possibly get away with it. And without a massive incentive in, in terms of a profit. So the private sector isn't going to move in and ride to the rescue. You know, this is our NHS. If those services are crap in the NHS, they're, they're crap for everybody. There is no alternative. We have to defend those services and we have to make them fit for, for patients and fit for purpose. And we have to conduct that campaign because nobody else is going to do it for us. Sadly, the Labour Party is going to do it for us. Okay? Where's the Labour Party on this? They're trying to argue why they didn't do anything at the time. They were in government. They're in government. Where did they intervene? What have they done since? How have they changed their policies since? They invented the policy of foundation trusts, supposedly being regulated by Monitor. 
monitor turns out to be about as useful as a horse meat regulator. <laughs> I mean, you know, for God's sake. These people, you know, it's just incredible. You've just got a market here in which nobody actually takes responsibility for anything. That seems to be it. You just pass around the problem, one to the other, a few people move in and make profits out of a bit of it, and nobody holds up their hands and says, OK, I messed up here, we need to do things differently in this way. Nobody does that. We just soldier on from one mistake to the next, reinventing the flat tyre, time and again. So, it's the dog that didn't bark. It's the private sector that's not interested in those services. It's the fact we all need those services. And as Karen said, somehow now we're being told these services aren't needed anymore. Somehow we're being told, oh, well, you know, we don't need all these district general hospitals because all these people are actually in these hospitals shouldn't be there, it should be cared for somewhere else. And the Tories have this plan, you know, the Tories are, are driving at the moment, I say I'm not entirely sure how different it would be if we had a Labour government in either, to be perfectly honest, but the Tories are actually pushing this plan at the moment where you actually, as, you, as, as Karen was saying, you thin out the hospital network. So you have fewer... Badly scarfed, demoralised, under-resourced, overcrowded units, so-called centralising services. And in the meantime, it's supposed to also allegedly have community-based services which are going to look after more and more people outside of hospital. There's a huge flaw in this plan, and well, there's many, but there's one very obvious one. There are no plans, there are no resources, there is no intention to build those community services. They don't exist. And nobody's intended to put them in place. There is no money to pay for them. All of the plans are very real for running down hospitals, sacking the staff and reducing the spending. But there is no plans whatsoever for the investment you would need, the management structures you would need, the systems you would need, the training of staff you would need to deliver the kind of community services they talk about. Neither is there any evidence that you can actually do the work of replacing hospitals. No evidence at all. Even McKinsey's that go around arguing for this have to admit, when put on the spot, there is no evidence for it. They just hope it will work. But well, they don't really care anyway. They're McKinsey's. They can walk away, go somewhere else. American consultants over here, overpaid, overrated, over here. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so, so um, yeah, so this is, this is the actual plan we're working to. Now, you, you know, I think this is a 